Bo, liebe Damen und Herren, äh, Entschuldigung, dass ich keiner Deutsch sprechen kann. So, I will uh, thank Karina and Christoph and everyone uh, and try to, you know, do my best in English. Uh, so, as uh, Christoph says, I was uh, director, but I'm, I'm a researcher at the Brazil's National Institute of Space Research. And I'm here at the University of Munster at the Institute of Geoinformatique for two years on paid leave, so I've got some support from Brazil. Now, uh, questions now that we have, there's a very good thing, I mean, there's a very bad, good and bad things about being one of the last speakers, people are more tired, but you as a speaker have a perspective of the audience and you also have a perspective of what the others have said. And there's one common thread between my talk and the other ones, is this perplexity that we all facing with the internet with the world of a digital age, and with the, our ability to use the tools, many of us have used the tools very creatively, the, the, the marked idea was a fantastic one, the crowdsourcing of the children's book was a wonderful, wonderful idea, so that's be beautiful, and yet we are all perplexed to where it leads. And, and, and I, and this is a common thread, and this will run through this talk. The difference between this talk and the others is that uh, most of the talks were about personal stories. This one is not. This is about a collective story that I'm the storyteller. I've been part of it. But this is a lot of people doing it. So the first thing is that runs the common thread here is the fact that uh, many of the talks we had, like the last one, the, the one talk, uh, came with an assumption which is not true, and the assumption is the world is flat. In the sense that, the, and, and the, the talk by Sasha, which is a fantastic one, also, also comes with that. I mean, the technology is there for everyone at the same level, and, and the cultures are the same. They're not. Each culture is different. In each situation, and the, the, the freedom that you have in many cases is not the other ones. And in that sense, nothing is doing uh, more harm to the the, the uh, objective of this stat today, which is understanding the world, then things like a brick. They talk about bricks, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. In fact, there's nothing such as bricks. Russia, India, and China are very different from each other, and certainly from Brazil. India and China are places with a very existing civilization. They existed before the West existed. They're very proud of it. They're very uh, forceful to support their civilizations. They're not going to change overnight and become Occidentals. They don't even think about it that way. Whereas Brazil is a very interesting case because Brazil is, has no civilization. Like uh, we say here, we're neither Europeans nor we are North Americans, but everything for us is ours because it's not ours. So we absorb ideas from Europe, from the Americas, from Africa. We have the biggest Japanese community outside Japan. So it's a melting pot, but this melting pot has one important thing, which is we are Europeans in that sense of wanting, not that we are Germans, do you don't want to be, we can never be, but we aspire to the sort of society that Germany has. And one very important thing is the crucial difference between Russia, India, China, and Brazil, apart from the fact that they have the bomb and we don't and we won't, is the fact that we pay a lot of attention to what goes outside and what people talk about Brazil. We care about what is said about Brazil. And this is important because this is something that came out in Nature, one of the leading world uh, scientific journals, and they said something that I think most of you would agree to, the global farm. So it says, oh, it, Brazil has a plentiful uh, sun that's water and has land. So Brazil is producing more and more food for the world. By the way, the pigs that are around Munster, it's probably about, what, two pigs for each Munster runner? Or three, I don't know. There's some statistics that say that either two or three pigs for each Munster runner. They eat soybeans from Brazil. And by the way, this soybean is genetically modified. So when someone talks about a biopic, don't believe it. 
Now, the other thing is, can it make these gains protecting the environment? So this is something that we had to face as Brazilians, as scientists, dealing with that. So the question is, how can we achieve growth and protecting of the environment? And this uh, was really the base for the work that we did. And this work took about one very important characteristic, something that you Germans take for granted, the existence of institutions. So you don't even think of that you go out at night and you don't have security. You don't even think that you don't live in a society where the access to knowledge is universal or that you are very much in favor of clean energy or that you are integrated in a European society. This is a given. You don't even think about it. But this is not universal. The world is not flat. In fact, institutions are the main thing that separates developed societies and undeveloped ones. And many of the societies, which might even have a gross national product, which is bigger than Germany, like China, may never enjoy, whatever the internet does, the same types of freedoms and institutions that Germany do. So our task was the following. How can we, and this is for collective people, use the scientific knowledge that we had, and we had a very good group, which is world very respected, about using remote sensing data, images from the sky, to map what actually happens below, in this case, to map deforestation. But the fact that you have this information doesn't change the world. You, can, you, you need to think, how can I use the power of the institutional power that you have and the power of internet to the ultimate change? It doesn't matter if the streets in Syria have cell phones or the streets in Europe have cell phones. If you don't get the power, you don't change this. It doesn't matter if all Chinese have a Baidu account, if there's no rule of law, they have no freedom of speech, they cannot access Wikipedia. So how can science help to make politicians act? This was the dilemma we had, and we had this knowledge. So we said, well, it's mapping, we know how to do. INPI has done mapping deforestation in Amazonia since 88. And this was in a situation where for a time, the state was considered secret. It was considered a secret of state so we would say how much had been deforested, but EP was prevented. We, I was prevented. I, once I asked the Minister of Science and Technology, can I put this data on the web? She, he said, absolutely no. This is a secret of state. So without understanding where deforestation was happening, we could not do anything. There was no way to set up a policy. So it was like the old maps that come from old, uh, let's say, pre-medieval times, pre, uh, let's say, pre-navigation times, where you had on the places like Africa, things like hic sunt leonis at the ground. Someone was talking about uh, Latin. This means, of course, in Latin, there, here are lions and dragons. Now, finally in 2004, a number of things changed. The most important one, there was a surge on deforestation. Deforestation in 2004 reached 27,000 square kilometers in one year. From now, how many times is this bigger than the Munster land? How big is the Munster land? Anyone knows? 5,000 square kilometers. I count, I went, we, unless the Deutsche Wikipedia. Deutsche, I mean, I, I, I don't trust the English Wikipedia, but if it's written in German, it must be right. So it is. 5,000 square kilometers. <laughs> so you had, in, imagine in one year, you wipe out one, two, three, four, five and a half monster lands. So imagine five and a half monster lands full of trees, and then the next year, five and a half monster land. <laughs> so what do you do? First of all, you take, and then I remember that's the crucial difference between Brazil, Russia, and India, and China we take public opinion very seriously. Once I was with President Lula and with a meeting to discuss deforestation, he was mad as hell because he just got a call from Gordon Brown at that time, the president, no, the prime minister of the UK, because Gordon Brown had read in the UK 
data that Impy had published the other day, so we published the data like 6 o'clock in the afternoon. We didn't have time to talk to Lula, so the meeting was at 12 o'clock the next day on a Friday. But of course, the Guardian had already been out, and Gordon Brown was already calling Lula to say what is happening in Brazil. So before we could tell Lula, Gordon Brown told him. He didn't like it very much, but he had the reaction. So the reaction is, first of all, what can you as scientists do? What as scientists you can do, look at what happens. Science are very good at understanding the world. So we found, well, the guys start by first taking a bit of the forest, then they run a fire, then they take half of the forest, and then they take everything. What you don't want to do is to wait until they have taken everything. So we developed something called a daily alert monitoring system, which is the system that we have used to do daily alerts, which tries to catch deforestation as it happens. So it's more or less like a crime mapping. So what we have is people looking at images every day, observing these images and pointing out all possible places where new deforestation is taking place, and the information is sent immediately to the federal police, to the army, to the Environmental Protection Agency, and immediately they go to the field with helicopters or cars to try to catch who's there. And we had also enormous help from the media. So the Globe TV network came to us and says, how can we help you fight deforestation? And we show them that website, which I showed. And the guy in the Global TV network said the same reaction from Christopher, uh, uh, the guys here in Moonset. This website is terrible. This is just for scientists. We want to do something professional. So they did at that time was Orkut, was the Brazilian Facebook. And they had 500,000 people registering, say, I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like this. So there was 40 million protests. At that moment, we felt, we felt, INPI as the institution, the moment to put the data on the web. And that's what we did. You know how many people we asked to put the data on the web? No one. We found out no one would then, with that public opinion, international and national, dare to question it. So things started to happen. Once they found out where deforestation was happening, there was a surge on going protected areas. So this was the situation. So what you have, you had in brown the deforestation mapped by INPI, our team. In uh, light yellow and green, you have the protected areas as they were in 1997. So look at the situation change in 2008, in 10 years. So the government was forced, more or less forced, but of course, people inside the government also working like the, uh, the then environment minister, Marina Silva, did a great job to put the, the forest uh, protected areas close to where deforestation is, because most protected areas in the world, including in many places, are away from where people live. So to have the courage to put protected areas near to avoid deforestation took a lot of public opinion and a lot of political will. And the command and control actions were very effective because they had the data. The guy didn't go, Amazonia is bigger than Europe. Take the whole Europe. It's just about the size of Amazonia. So if you don't have information, you cannot go to the field. So 90% of the operations were in 2% of the area. And the private sector had to move. So the private sector now said, OK, I'm exporting soy to Munster and the Munster pigs, but the Munster guys are very serious. But these guys are no, the Farhad start, and of course, that's, that's energy vendor, and they don't, want, they don't want to be associated with bad things. So I'm not going to buy soy to export to Munster if you are in an area which has deforestation. And this is actually the strangest thing in the world because it's a pact between the soybean producers, the soybean exporters, Greenpeace, and we verify the data. And it's been now. 1% of the soy that's been exported now is, comes from defore, newly deforested areas. 99% of the soy comes from clean areas. So that all led, then that comes the politics. Politicians are very smart people, contrary to what we think. We think politicians are dumb, they're extremely smart. And take that Angela Merkel is no exception, and Schroeder was no exception, and Lula is no exception. So what happened is, after everything was moving in the right direction, 
Lula was, had this insight. Let me go to Copenhagen because he had this idea that Copenhagen, the climate change conference where Obama went, I think Merkel went, uh, Gordon Brown went, the Chinese went, nothing there. I'm going to tell the only big good story that will happen. And the only good story is Brazil will pledge to reduce deforestation by 80% relative to, to what it was in the past. Because he knew he had the political tools, the technical tools, the, the infrastructural tools, and he had the ability to project. So he did good things, he did bad things as well, like you know, accepting to have the World Cup in Brazil and have, second to have the Olympics, but that's another story. Politicians also, you know, they do what they think it's right for them. In this case, it was right for Lula, but it was also right for the world. Then, as a result, deforestation went down sharply. So we got this, this is the editorial from Nature on the run up to the Rio 2020. And it says, deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon is down by a staggering 78%. So it says, if Brazil can maintain this, this will be the biggest environmental success story in decades and would set an example to the world. And that's exactly what Brazil wanted, to be seen as a, as a country who had the right will to do it. But this was possible because not one person, not this person talking to you, I was just one person there, it was just because a set of institutions moved. A lot of people inside the government, outside the government, in the press, got together, made the political move. The end result is exactly as many of you have predicted, openness, transparency brings governance when the institutions move. Openness by itself does not bring governance, but if the institutions are there, if the will is there, if the organization is there, you get change. And this is what we got in Brazil. And thank you very much. <laughs>